chapter 6. We'll read more, get into more verses in this, but let's read verses 6 and 7 of uh, Romans chapter 6. Verse 6 says, uh, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Let's bow our heads for another word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, thank you, Lord, uh, for your Holy Spirit that gives us the, the knowledge of salvation your word says that we know that we're yours by the spirit that you give us and we're so thankful for him being a part of our life once salvation occurs and lord uh, may we rely upon him as he wants to teach us may we be the pupil that we need to be the learner that we need to be as he instructs us on your way and as the things that he instructs us of glorifies you. And Lord, uh, be with us this morning. If there's any that does not know you and the free pardon of sin, as your Holy Spirit does their work on their life, convicting them of the sin of unbelief, I ask you to give them the faith to answer that knock and to believe. We thank you for all these things in, in Jesus' name. Amen. I read this week about uh, Dwight L. Moody, who was in a meeting, and during that meeting, this man stood up and said, I want to give a testimony. I want to tell you what I have, uh, it has taken me 42 years to learn. And I've, I've been doing some math and uh, 42 years ago. Uh, I was younger than I am now, and I had, uh, 42 years ago, I had been saved for just a little while, and uh, thinking about 42 years, I, I wonder about the things that the Lord has taught me over those 42 years, but this is, this is what the man said. Moody said, uh, well, uh, what is it that's taken you 42 years to learn, because I if I can learn it in three minutes, please tell me what you, it's taken you 42 years to learn. And this is what the man said. This is what I've learned. Number one, I can do nothing to earn salvation. Number two, God does not require me to do anything. And number three, Jesus Christ has done it all. Now, we went through that in probably about a minute. But this man testified, it's taken me 42 years to learn that. In Romans 6, there's three words. We've talked about them before. Talked about one of them there in verse 6, and it's in there more than just that verse 6. The word knowing. You look on down to verse 11. Reckon. Uh, that's another way of Southerners putting fixing to, or could be. Uh, I reckon I'm going to. I reckon I'm fixing to. I reckon. And then the third word is down there in verse 16. No, it starts out with no again in uh, K-N-O-W, but that word is yield. And we're going to talk about those words here for just a minute. Uh, what I'm fixing to tell you, I don't know if it happened in 1996, or excuse me, 1997 or 1998. It was one of them summers. I want to lean toward it was 1998. It could have been nineteen the summer of 1997. I do know it was a summer. And uh, I was taking a class at UNA uh, 
The reason I think it was the summer of 98 because I finished my master's degree in 98, started at 97 and during the summer. And uh, I'm wanting to think this was one of the last classes I took. It was a class called Educational Psychology. And we learned in there that week, that, uh, that during that uh, month, that uh, the following thing. Now, do I remember it exactly? Uh, no, but uh, looking it up, Google calls this pop words. So this group of fellows got up during that class. And said, our wives has given us a grocery list. We had no paper, so we're going to teach you this grocery list using these words. And it goes one through ten. One is a bun. We need some hot dog buns. Two is a shoe. Uh, Close your eyes, think of your shoe being covered with mustard because we're going to need some mustard for them hot dogs. Three is a tree. Uh, we might bake an apple pie after a while. And I want you to picture an apple tree with uh, some apples on it. Uh, four is a door. As you approach that door and grab the handle, it's really a hot dog because we need some hot dogs to go on them buns and with that mustard. Five is a hive. I noticed this morning we was out of honey. We're going to need some honey. And so dripping out of that hive you got in your mind is some honey. Six is a sticks. We need some sticks to roast them hot dogs with. Seven is heaven. be nice to have some marshmallows to go with that because since we'd already got the sticks, might as well roast some marshmallows while we're at it. Eight is a gate. Let's get some chocolate, and that gate we're fixing to go through is made out of chocolate. Nine is a line. Uh, used all the bacon this morning on that clothesline. Bacon's hanging from that clothesline. And then ten's a hen. We need some eggs. So... We, one of the tests we did that, that summer was we had to give that back, word for word. I ain't going to test you this morning, but I did learn this, that learning is a relatively permanent thing. In other words, it don't stick with us all the time. Things we knew, I mean, just had them hammered in us years ago. We need something sometimes to remind us about as we don't use it as much. Learning is a relatively permanent thing in an individual's knowledge or behavior that results from a previous experience. And I want you to think back for just a minute to the day you were saved. When you first tasted of the grace of God, that's a previous experience. Those who have not been saved don't have that knowledge because they have rejected the grace of God. Now, uh, also during that class, and uh, if you talk to anybody that's been in my youth group since 1998, they know that everywhere we went, we did this. I call it the name game. I don't know what in the world it's not called. But we, there was about uh, 30 of us in that room, educators. And uh, the first person to the right of the professor had to give their name. The second person had to give their name and the person that went before them. And then the 30th, 31st professor, she had to give her name and all 30. And then she started the other way. She gave some, her name and some information about herself, and then we had to go through the whole process again. And we got over there to one lady, and she said, I can't. And so we sat there and listened to that professor berate her, telling her that, yes, you can, and we're going to sit here till you do. And finally, she did. Now, on a side note, 
the professor was not Dr. Love, but Dr. Lovett. And her information was, on August 12th, my twin's going to be 50. And so it went around the room. You remember learning is a relative to permanent thing in individuals' knowledge or behavior. That results from a previous experience. Came around to this one person, and she goes, if your twin's going to be 50, how old are you? Exactly. That's what, exactly what, uh, what happened. There are some things in life as a child of God that we need to know. And learning is relatively permanent. Sometimes the Holy Spirit has to remind us of a few things. If you look with me to verse 6. Knowing this, well, knowing what? Well, if we'll look back up to verse 3. I think that's the first encounter, best I can tell, of the word know in chapter 6 of Romans. It says there, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. That's one of the pictures that baptism gives us is that that body is lowered down into a watery grave raised to walk in newness of life, telling forth to everybody that's there, to everybody that knows that this has occurred, something's happened in this individual's life. They have been saved, and that's what makes them a candidate for baptism because the Holy Spirit doesn't baptize them to begin with at the moment of salvation. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death in that watery grave, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, verse 6, knowing this, knowledge, knowing this, we are identifying with him. What does identification mean? Well, it means that we have become one with the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember he prayed before he went to the cross. Father, I pray that they may be one as you and I are one. So knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. One traveler made his way to the Holy Land several years ago, and uh, as they were being led around by the guide, the guide asked this question, have any of you been here before? And this one guy Raise his hand. Only, only one. Raise his hand. And uh, so the guy I asked, uh, when was you here? And he said, I was here about 2,000 years ago. If you're saved this morning, you was there too. I ain't never set foot on the holy land, literally, but I was there. If you turn over with me to Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20, I've realized this more and more as life goes on, my Christian walk goes on, and I'm so thankful for this. David, when he had to battle with Goliath, he realized something. We, we went through this uh, a couple of years ago about David fighting Goliath. David realized that battle wasn't his. He realized that battle was the Lord's. That's where victory begins. Is the things that we face, it's not really ours. Battle, it's the Lord's battle. Paul writes Galatians 2 and verse 20. 
I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So 2,000 years ago, thereabouts, we were there. And that gentleman testified this. Jesus died on the cross. He died for our sins. We died with him. Adrian Rogers puts it this way. When Jesus died, I died. When Jesus was buried, I was buried. Why does the Bible put an emphasis on the burial of Jesus Christ? Well, that's part of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, we talked about that faint Wednesday night. He died. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. They buried him. And on the third day, he arose. The burial, very important. Jews put bodies in the grave soon after their death. And that's how they did Christ. They realized he was dead. They wanted to, didn't want the Sabbath to start with Christ uh, hanging on the cross. And so they buried him right away. So I'm crucified with Christ. If you're saved, that's you as well. We need to know that. Sometimes the Holy Spirit has to bring it back to our memory, but we need to know that. We read this uh, last week, week four. But the last part of Romans chapter five says where grace abounded or where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And somebody might get the idea, well, hey, let's go out and live it up then or we'll get more grace. Because no? uh-uh. what we didn't read at the beginning of chapter six here, we read a few weeks ago. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2 answers that. God forbid. Now, in all of what I told y'all during the uh, announcements this morning about my week last week, snow cream was not involved. I didn't even dust off my snow traps and set them out. James, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm still looking. I'm still looking. Now, my Uncle Joe used to tell me, he said, well, if you want snow, go north. Look at verse 11 with me. There's some things that we need to know. That our old man is crucified with him. And that he that is dead is freed from sin. And uh, verse 11. Likewise. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed and to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Somebody might ask me, do you want some snow cream? Why, I reckon I do. And let me just tell you this. In one sense of the word, you can reckon upon that too. With me. Why, I reckon he does. And let me tell you this. Snow cream, do I want some? You can rely upon that fact. Because one definition of the word reckon is to rely upon. So let's look at it that way. Verse 11. Likewise, rely upon this, that you also are dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Reckoning is not closing your eyes and pretending it is faith acting on what you know to be true. If learning is indeed a relatively permanent thing in an individual's knowledge and behavior that results from the previous experience, we have to have had that experience with Christ in order to know that we're saved. One of my friends come to me during the invitation years ago, Brother Butler gave this verse. 
And here it is. If you want it, if you got it marked, I got it marked. John 5, 24. This is something you can rely upon. You can reckon on. You can know and rely upon it. And I guess I might as well say it like Brother Butler would have. Verily, verily, truly, truly, surely, surely, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death to life. That's something we need to know. That's something we need to rely upon. Something we can lay our head on it on our, when we lay our head on a pillow at night. As Fanny Crosby put it, blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. So rely upon the fact that it's real. A woman sets her alarm clock and it went off at six in the morning. Now, I've been, I've been in this situation and maybe you hadn't, but I've, I've been here along the same lines of story. A woman set her alarm clock, it went off at six in the morning, but when she awoke, she thought it can't possibly be six. Why, it just seems like I've just been asleep just a few minutes. She looked at the clock. It said six o'clock. She looked outside. The sun was up. She looked at the other clocks in the house. Guess what they all say? Six o'clock. If the sun, moon, stars, and every clock in your house says it's six o'clock, Guess what? It's six o'clock. We can rely upon that. And we can rely also that if we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, sin should have no more dominion in our life. Now, again, I've had people tell me, well, uh, I'm going, I'm going off and, uh, uh, God, you, you you stay here. I'm, I'm going over yonder. Do what I want to. I've had people tell me, uh, I'm going to do what I want to. Well, just realize this. That you can go out and do whatever you want to, but if you're a child of God, you're taking God with you. you there ain't no dropping off. There ain't no bus stop you can drop him off at anywhere. There ain't no taxi to call and say, hey, would you take him somewhere and I'll catch up with him later. No, he's with us. He's never going to leave us, never going to forsake us. If we want to go water in the mud pen, Mud hole, the pig pen, we're taking him with us. We're taking him with us. So verse 11 again, Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead and to deed and to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now let's look at verse 13. We'll go on down to verse 16 here in just a minute. Most everybody in this room knows what the word yield means. I've heard about this fella that uh, he didn't much less know what yield, yield means. He didn't know what stop mean, meant. And the people of the community were concerned. Their kids playing out in the road, this, that, and the other. And this guy just came up and uh, didn't even yield, didn't even slow down, didn't stop. It was a stop sign. It just kept rolling through. And it went on for weeks, days, years. And finally, somebody told a policeman, would you come out? and observe this stop sign. This fella, he, he don't know what stop means. He don't even, apparently don't even know what yield means. People have to slam on their brakes because they're coming, and he just thinks he owns everything and just keeps going. So didn't take the policeman long. Sure enough, he saw the same thing everybody else saw. So he pulls the guy over, walks up to the door, Pulls out his nightstick, 
and just reaches in that car and just works that guy up one side down the other. You say, well, I believe I saw that on you. No, it, nobody videoed it. But in the process of just working that guy over, he asked him, do you want me to slow down? Do you want me to stop? Well, I want you to stop. I want you to stop that stop sign back there. Never did have trouble with that guy not stopping the stop sign anymore. He knew exactly what it meant. Well, what about a yield sign? Oh, where's the yield sign? That means I can go. Yeah. If there's some oncoming traffic, you might want to stop. Most of us know what yield means. We don't have to get worked over with a nightstick to know what stop, what yield means. But look at verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Unto sin. Oh, there comes sin. Let's jump on board. No. But yield yourselves. God, here you take control. God, here I am. You take control. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments. Of righteousness unto God. One of the greatest hymns uh, that I know of is the hymn "Amazing Grace." Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I got a lot of favorites, and uh, but "Amazing Grace" got to be up there, top a hundred anyway, top five. I once was lost. But now I'm found. God loves us. Who are we going to yield to? Do you know if you're saved or not? Have you got the faith to rely upon your salvation? That Jesus did pay it all? Has it taken you 42 years to learn that? Like the fellow did with the, I talked about earlier. And who do we yield to? Do we yield to the world? Oh, this is what the world wants me to do. Everybody else to do it. it. must be okay. Or do we yield ourselves to God? We cannot serve God and mammon. Now look down at verse 16. There's that word no again. K-N-O-W. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, His servants, you are. Makes sense to me. Who we yield to? That's whose servants we are. Are we yielding to God? Who you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, there are some I know for years who've said, yeah, ain't no such thing as right and wrong no more. Just do whatever you want to do. Nike, who, Greek word for the word victory. Oh, just do it. Whatever you want to do, just do it. But then there's God's word that talks about the word sin. James 4 and 17 puts it this way. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Who are we going to yield ourselves to? Sin or to the Lord? Now, King Saul, you remember, the one who was head and shoulders above everybody else. Oh, give us a king. Everybody else got one. Give us, we want one. Give us a king. So, God gave him the guy that was head and shoulders and height above everybody else. And he told him to go out and do something. He knew what he was supposed to do. Who did he yield to? He didn't yield to God. 
God told him to go out and utterly destroy the Amalekites. He brought the king back as a prisoner. And the people, he allowed them to bring the spoils back because why? Well, we're going to sin. We've got to offer up the best. And hey, have some good looking animals in here. Then Samuel showed up. Samuel didn't even say a word, but Saul saw him coming and said, oh, I've done what God called me to do. Here's a question one day we're going to stand and give an account for. Marty, did you do what I called you to do? Marty, did you do what I equipped you to do? Marty, did you use the power of the Holy Spirit and in doing so, did you take the glory or did the glory come to me? Because if the Holy Spirit's involved, it glorifies him. I'm going to have to give him the count. You're going to have to give him the count as a child of God. So Samuel said, or Saul said to Samuel, uh, hey, I've done everything that God asked me to do. Then those words. Samuel said, then what is the blatant sheep in my ear that I hear? Oh, the people did that. And here's what Samuel said to him. Because Saul went down that road. Oh, they're going to offer them up a sacrifice to God. Here's what Samuel said. To obey is better than sacrifice. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Who are we serving today? Who are we living for today? If we're saved, know that. Rely upon it. And yield ourselves instruments to God to be used of by Him. If we're lost, get saved. Know that Jesus loves you. Know that Jesus died for you. Know that Jesus wants to make intercession for you at the right hand of the Father. He don't want it law laid on you. He loves us. Gave himself for us. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be gathered as we are today. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that it's a no-so salvation, that we can rely upon those things. Help us, Lord, to yield, not to the things of this world, but yield ourselves to you. So easy just to go along with the crowd, do what the crowd's doing. Lord, we need to be following you, not the crowd. Have your way in this invitation time. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.